Thank you, Mark. So, first of all, it's my pleasure to welcome you all to University of Dundee. It's great to finally see you. We started planning this about a year ago, and it's great to finally have a room full of people. So, thank you very much for joining us today. So, who's seen the movie The Martian? Okay, quite a few people. I took my mother to see it, and my mother said that was, and she was crying, and she said that was a really emotional movie. And all I could say is, did you see the computers? Did you see the computer science? That was amazing. And she just didn't get it. But today, I'm in a room full of computer scientists, so I'm sure you guys will all get it. And so I thought, with that movie and with the fact it's inspired a lot of us, wouldn't it be great to find out what's really going on in Dundee to do with Mars exploration? And so I'm really pleased that we've got Ian Martin here from our space science research group. He's going to tell us all about his work on Mars exploration. Thank you. Hi there. Uh, thanks, Karen. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about what I do. When Karen asked me to do this, I was a little bit unsure because I thought, well, this is a computing at schools conference. And although we academics love talking about what we do, I thought, well, maybe it's not really quite so appropriate for this conference. So then I thought, well, I also teach computer science, like I'm sure a, a lot of you do. Um, I teach uh, graphics to honor students, and I have taught a lot of uh, programming to first years. So I thought, well, a lot of the concepts that I use in my work um, are actually quite related to what I teach my first years. So although the scale is bigger, the concepts, the good practice, the, the way you go about solving a problem um, is similar to what I encourage my first years to do. I, I don't particularly like them sitting down hacking out code because they tend to get in horrendous muddles that you then have to sort. So um, I thought I'd try and relate a bit of space stuff to um, first year programming and design work, um, if, if that's possible. It's not really just about Mars. I touched on Mars, but it's not really, really about Mars. I did see the Martian, but I didn't think of that when I was doing this. Um, so the background is the University of Dundee has what's called the Space Technology Centre, of which I, I'm part of. And there's three strands to it. Um, there's a satellite receiving station, which um, is a really brilliant resource that um, is NERC funded. So it's, you might have seen on top of some of the build, university buildings, there's these satellite receivers. So they take in data and they process them from um, various environmental satellites and they disseminate them in real time. So that means sa uh, scientists can get access to, for instance, current environmental data within hours of it happening. So if there's a fire somewhere, if there's algae blooms in, in, in some lake somewhere on the ocean, um, they can get access to it. So it's a fantastic resource. And they've also got an archive going back to the 70s. So you can use the archive to see how the Earth has changed um, over, the seven, um, over the last you know, 40 years, which is an, an amazing archive. There's also Star Dundee, which is a spin-off company where we um, commercialize some of our space or our onboard network stuff. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about that because I've only got so much time. And um, there's also our space systems research group, which does a bit of space war, space, spacecraft onboard network stuff, but also does stuff on um, planetary landers, which is what I'll sort of focus my sort of half an hour talk on, on today. Um, basically, what we, we are looking to do is we want to make it possible for spacecraft to land safely on other planets. Um, and we want to prove that the technology is possible so people are willing to spend lots of money on it. Um, so I'm going to give you a little bit about the background about how we come, came to the situation, um, very sort of brief history, but n not very much, and then show you why we're using computing science to try and address this problem. Okay. I should perhaps also add that um, we're mainly funded in this work by the European Space Agency, and um, they've been great to us over the years. They're essentially our customer. Um, so I'm going to look at using computing to solve a problem. So I'm going to try and take this very I relate this to the steps you would do if you were solving any sort of standard computing problem. As although this is a fairly complex and big and uh, risky example, the same approach um, applies. So we're going to look at problem analysis and specification. Um, we did feasibility studies. Um, we do some requirements. Um, you obviously need to do some sort of software design, software engineering. Um, we implemented it, and that involved lots of programming. And there's lots of iterations, and we need to test and evaluate it. So those sort of um, goals, those sort of design approaches, are what we teach or try and embed into our students um, so they become good software developers um, when they leave us. So problem analysis. What am I trying to do? Well, fundamentally, landing a spacecraft on another planet is a challenging task. 
And going back to the Martian that Karen mentioned, some of the computing is fantastic, but some of it didn't seem that realistic to me. Okay? <laughs> I thought, well, maybe, maybe, maybe not, maybe not. It's a really challenging task. And also, it's very difficult to prove that you can do it. And that, that's the biggie. Nobody's going to want to let you, know, let you spend billions, I'm talking billions of pounds, on something that's going to fail. And historically, lots of them have failed. So it's a very diff difficult thing. Um, the sort of main concept is, say you want to go to a probe on Mars. There's been some brilliantly successful rovers that are on Mars at the moment. Or you want to go to the comet, the Rosetta mission, or an asteroid. Um, often you don't know what's there. You know to some very low resolution what's there. Um, the comet, we didn't know anything about it. Even Mars, where we have lots of um, information about remote sensing of the planet, it's not to um, particular high resolution detail. We don't have GPS. So if you wanted to do something on Earth, you've got GPS to tell you exactly where you are. And you've probably got really detailed maps inside your computers that you can, you can address as well. In space, we don't have that problem. We don't have that information. So we have to, if we want to send a spacecraft to another planet, the, the two main options are have, make it autonomous. So that means that um, it does it all itself with some input from Earth, but you can't control it from Earth because the time delay from signals between the Earth and the spacecraft is just too, too, too long. By the time you recognize the hazard, for instance, in a landing scenario, it would have crashed. So it has to either do it itself or there has to be humans on board to do it. The human angle is very expensive and very risky and terrible publicity when you kill people. So, um, that's, that's, so our approach really is though humans in space is fantastic, like the Martians, we don't think it's going to happen that much because of the expense is so difficult and, the publicity, and the, 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 it's so much more difficult to put a human into space than it is a robot, a robot essentially. So what do we have to do? Send our spacecraft to another planet. It's normally, the lander's normally in two bits. There's a big ship that goes there um, and then enters orbit around where you want to go, whether it's a comet or a planet, and then it ejects its lander module, which will then have to descend to the surface. Now, the fundamental problem is the lander module is going to have an enormous velocity with respect to the planetary surface. So you've got to reduce that velocity and land where you want to go. All tends to happen pretty quickly on a big planet because um, you don't have enough fuel to sort of hover around like a computer game and play around and move here, there, and everywhere. You really have to go directly where you want to go and minimize and break as hard as you can and minimize the amount of fuel you waste because it's so expensive to send anything up into space. And the more fuel you have, the less scientific instruments you have. Okay. So we have a limited fuel for redirection. We must reduce our velocity for landing. And um, we have something that's called this landing eclipse. So the landing eclipse is the area in which case your spacecraft can land. Um, and as you get closer to, this, to the, your landing site, the landing eclipse will shrink and shrink and shrink. So you only have so much fuel to redirect. And so, many, um, so you can't just fly around, fly around indefinitely. Um, you might be surprised how, how inaccurate lots of landers have been. So I sort of taking the problem and sort of abstract it like we would in, um, to, uh, to sort of make a computer model of what we're trying to do. We've got our spacecraft. It gets to where we want to go, position initialization. We then have to work out where we are. Now, we know roughly where we are, but, how, but if knowing where we are precisely is very important to go to where the scientists want us to go. So it's got to do this autonomously. So it's got various sensors on board. It's got cameras that can point to the stars and try and map it to star maps. It's got cameras that will point to the surface and pick out features on the surface. Um, it's got gyroscopes. It's got um, uh, a myriad of other, other, other sensors that will all try to feed into its main computer to try and work out where it is. And then it does surface relative navigation. So what, if it knows where it is rough, reasonably accurately, then it can fly to where the scientists want it to go. Um, so there's sort of two sort of types of landing. There's kind of like a dumb landing which just kind of hits the planet, um, goes roughly where the scientists want to go, possibly within hundreds of kilometers. But we're trying to aim for a precise landing. So for instance, land on the rim of a crater near the south pole of the moon so we can look for water ice. And that's much, much, much more difficult. So the surface relative navigation, you pick out points on the surface using computer, um, computer vision, essentially image processing um, or other sorts of sensor processing. And then we fly towards our surface. And then the last bit is hazard detection. Obviously, there might be something really nasty there in our landing site, like a big rock. We don't want to land in shadow because we've got solar panels that we want to put out and get sunlight for energy. So it's a, it's a, a very difficult problem, but it's also a very difficult problem to prove that you can do it. Um, okay, a whole bunch of sensors. The, the one on the top left is a star tracker. That's a, a camera. There's a gyroscope. So it's got all these sensors. It takes all the data and uh, fuses it together um, to try and give us uh, well, an internal program that will fuse it together um, and try and fly it. So cameras are one of the best sensors there are, um, mainly because they're light. Um, they're really light. 
Um, so that's a great thing to put in a spacecraft because it's much less expensive to send up. And you get an enormous amount of power in terms of the, the data. Your cameras can take such high resolution data. Um, the technology is so advanced and compared to some, some other sensors. So computer vision, you can take the, the camera on board the spacecraft, takes the picture, um, the, out, the computer on board looks at the images, does image processing using computing algorithms, and uses that to work out where it's going, what it wants to do. Um, so they're also they've got no moving parts. Moving parts are terrible on board a spacecraft because moving parts can fail, and we don't want to do that. Um, the, comp the challenges are that there's very complex processing algorithms. Obviously, the, the algorithms can go wrong. They, they may have been not developed properly. Um, and also that you need very fast processors with lots of memory. Space processors tend to lie behind commercial ones because they have to work in a high radiation, um, high temperature, well, high temperature uh, variance environment. Um, but the rewards are very high, okay? Now, where we come in is we need to prove this technology. So there's been many, many space missions have been sent out to, to planets, and they tend to get cut down and cut down and cut down. By that I mean there was a, ESA sent out a, a mission to Mercury a while back called uh, Bepi Colombo, and there was um, a lander component on the original mission, but that eventually got cut. It got cut partly for funding and partly because they weren't sure the technology was viable. They weren't sure that people that had proved that they could actually get this lander to land precisely and safely as they wanted it to go. So we need to prove the technology. Um, we need to take the, so the spacecraft's coming to land, it takes images off the surface, and it turns into a hazard map. So the yellow bits are hazard, the cross in the middle is where you want it to go. Um, we want to make it a precise, accurate landing, you know, within maybe 100 meters of the landing site. Um, now that's not actually um, been done before. As an example how inaccurate landers have been, talking of Mars, this is an image of Gale Crater, which is a large crater in Mars, hundreds of kilometers wide. And you can see a bunch of ellipses. The biggest one, the Viking one, um, was the, the first Martin, Martian Viking lander um, that was um, successful. But it was landing within an, an ellipse of maybe 600 kilometers across. So it, the scientists pointed it roughly where they wanted to go, but they couldn't land accurately. Um, the MSL, the one in the center, that's about six kilometers across. Now that's a lot, lot more accurate. Um, and that's the Mars Science Laboratory. Um, there's a rover called Curiosity, which is about the size of a car currently on Mars, that was landed um, by, the, by the MSL. And that's probably the best, la most successful lander that's ever happened. That was a, a NASA mission. Um, but it's still six kilometers across, so it's not what I'd call a precise lander. Um, so we can do this. There is a technology exists um, to... to process images and other sensors and make the spacecraft entirely on its own land where it wants to go. You know, people have done, people can do this, but they've never really proved it to people um, who, have, who control the purse strings, so it's never actually happened in reality. Um, so we need to test it. We need to, we need to show that it will actually work in reality. Um, two types of testing that's really common in this is open and closed loop testing. So the idea of open loop testing is from your initial stage testing. Um, you might have, say you wanted to land on the moon, um, you'd have a whole bunch of images from the moon, and you would test your algorithm to see if it can go where you want it to go. Um, but you've got a pre-created pre set of images. So we've got, our, we've got our navigation sensor data, we feed it into our spacecraft flight software, um, it estimates where the spacecraft will go, and it can see if it can land. But you've only got this pre-created set of images, there's, there's no feedback. Um, a better test system is where you have... Um, the spacecraft being simulated. We have images being fed into it, which is the simulated sensor data. Um, the spacecraft then, there's also a dynamic model that works out where the spacecraft is going, and it's combined with the um, image processing um, information, and that then moves our spacecraft, which we then we get a new um, set of sensor data that then gets processed. Our spacecraft moves again, and the information of the spacecraft moving gets fed back in so we get a new set of images. Now that's a closed loop testing which is much better, it's much more like a real scenario, so the spacecraft can move where it wants to go. Um, and for that though, we need to have this simulated sensor data. Now, that's a difficult thing. How can you, without sending your spacecraft to Mars, the Moon, or the asteroid, provide this simulated sensor data? Okay. So that's really where we, we came in. Um, to show you how, how difficult this is, or how little that's, this has been done, um, 
There was a whole bunch of science on the moon in the 60s and 70s with the Apollo landings. I'm sure you're all familiar with that. Um, the USSR also had a lander program which sent, didn't send um, humans there, but they did send probes there that landed there. They had um, successful landings and missions. And then there was an enormous, enormous gap. There hasn't been a soft landing on the moon. Um, well, there hadn't been until the Chinese Chang'e mission. There hadn't been a soft landing on the moon um, since the 70s. Um, so the, the Apollo landing one, that had a human on board. Um, and I don't know if you've ever seen the footage or seen pictures from it, but uh, as Neil Armstrong and uh, uh, the other two, Buzz Aldrin, and I forget the third one, everyone does, was, uh, <laughs> it's, it's not fair at all. Um, as they were heading towards um, the landing site, um, they were, the spacecraft had a very, very basic guidance system on it, and it was heading into this crater interior that was full of enormous boulders. And he was able to sort of see this was happening and manually navigate the little spacecraft over this crater and land on the planes below. Um, he only had 30 seconds of fuel left. That's not a lot, you know. So it was tight, and if he hadn't been manually doing it, it would have crashed into this rock. Like that, okay? That would have been the end of it, okay? That is a moon rock, and that's one of the uh, Apollo astronauts on it. So he would have crashed into something like that. So that's what we have to avoid. There was quite a recent soft landing on the moon, um, the, the, the Chang'e Chinese mission in uh, December 2013. Um, that was quite an impressive mission. Um, they used the thruster to reduce their altitude to about 100 meters, and they hovered around to try and find a safe landing site. And then they descended about four meters, and then they shut down the engines, and the little um, lander fell to the surface um, about 40 kilometers away from the intended landing site. But it was still pretty impressive. Unfortunately, the poor Jade Rabbit rover didn't last very long. Um, but it was still a very um, imp impressive landing mission. There has been Mars landers, various mixed successes. There have been fantastic, successful Martian landers. Um, there's Spirit and Opportunity were two amazing rovers that um, got an amazing amount of science data. And the current Curiosity one is, is, is doing fantastic as well. But there's also been some absolutely terrible Martian missions that have wasted an awful lot of money with them, failed landers. Um, the, the Mars Science Laboratory, which is the, the current one, um, had a really quite interesting land, land, landing scenario. It was a seven minute descent. The, the lander was coming in with enormous velocity, um, had a heat shield, which then took a bit of the heat, um, there's a thin atmosphere on Mars. Um, it then was then injected, a parachute came out, reduced velocity a little bit more, and then they had another bit of the, the lander, which was just firing reverse rockets to try and reduce the, the thrust. The difficulty with this lander was their rover was so enormous. Um, the Curiosity rover is about the size of a car. So they used something quite impressive called the Sky Crane rocket. Um, probably easier to show you a picture of what it is. This is an artist's impression of what it is. The thing at the top is the um, uh, rocket uh, lander thing that's firing its thrusters backwards. That, that there is the rover, and it's on a sky crane. So the idea is it, it was the, the, the ropes slowly, the c cables um, slowly deposited on the surface. So it, it gets near the surface, and then the cables come out, and it descends, and then they get cut. Um, that worked very, very well. It was a really impressive landing, um, but it was only accurate within a six-kilometer ellipse. Okay. So it was not, still not a pre precise landing. There has been many, many failures. Um, the Mars Climate Orbiter was probably one of the most famous failure. And that actually bizarrely failed because some engineers were using some European components and some American components, and they really didn't test the fact that there was imperial and metric um, units. Now, this is honestly true, and that caused the uh, calculations of um, the orbit uh, trajectory to go wrong, and it basically burnt up because it didn't hit the orbit directly. It sort of skimmed into the orbit generated too much heat, boom, okay? Testing, very, very important. All software testing is very, very important. And of course, our poor little Beagle lander didn't work very well either, although, unfortunately, that took a lot of publicity. It was a brilliant European space mission, um, the, the Mars Express, which is an orbiter that took a lot of, um, that flew around Mars um, and generated an enormous amount of um, scientific data. But our poor little Beagle lander didn't really have the funds, wasn't developed properly, and didn't have enough redundancy on board. So um, we think it landed, but we think it um, didn't um, unfurl all its instruments properly. Um, there's also small body landers. Um, so um, they have a different set of problems because there isn't so much gravity. 
Landing can be slow because there's not much gravity to force the thing into the surface. So you, the challenge is then to make your velocity match the tumbling asteroid or comet or object and then slowly go to the surface. That itself is also very difficult. Um, I'll leave this up and I'll start running out of time. Um, the recent lander on a small object at the top left, uh, the, the comet, um, that nearly went well but didn't quite go well. Um, again, to show you how difficult this thing is, the reason it didn't go so well is that it was supposed to go to the land on the surface and then fire some pins into the comet and then stick there. But unfortunately, the, the, the explosive uh, material that was supposed to fire the pins um, deteriorated in the vacuum over, over the... the, the um, nobody knew this would happen um, but the, over the, the time it had been sent from the Earth to the comet, so it bounced. And that's why it ended up bouncing into an unfortunate position. Um, Small bodies are quite difficult. The one on the bottom is Itakawa, which is a small asteroid, near Earth asteroid, that a Japanese spacecraft has um, um, visited. The one on the top right is Vesta, which is a large asteroid, and the one on the top left is the comet. Um, and their, their sizes are, 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 are Itakawa was quite small, Vesta is quite big. Um, I'm showing you these to show you how different these things can be and how different they can look. And so the challenges in, are, are quite uh, dif different as well. That's the comet close up. Looks like nothing I've ever seen before, and no one had ever seen, seen something like that before. And that, this is the lander. Um, it was supposed to land, uh, this is the, the time, 15, 14, 15, 19, 15, 23 in, in seconds. Um, unfortunately, it touched down, and then it didn't stick in like it was meant to, and then bounced, and unfortunately bounced into a, um, underneath a cliff. I have heard that it's come alive again very briefly, but it's not done very much, and we're still waiting. It might, it might do, but we don't know. Okay, so I've gone quite a lot of detail on the problem specification. That's the problem. Landing spacecraft and other planets is very difficult. It's really want to do it to try and learn more about our solar system, our universe, um, and we really need to develop the technology to prove that it can work. It's very, 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 very costly. You can do physical simulations. You can get a helicopter on, on, on an, above a desert to simulate a, um, a, a spacecraft landing on that, but the conditions are so very different on Earth with different gravity, different lighting. It's not really... It's a useful part of the, the test system, but, but it's, it's not, not the whole thing. That's not enough. Um, you can also have things like this. This is, this is a real thing in the European Space Agency called CAMROB. It's got some plaster of Paris-like terrain, a camera on a robotic arm, and that can move, and that can be used to simulate a lander. So it can take images, feed it into our closed-loop test system, and it can be moved, and then we can see if the, the, the lander software can land accurately um, under different conditions. However, lots of problems with that. The lighting's really difficult to get, to get right. Um, it's really hard to simulate sunlight in, in a room. Um, the... Um, Calibration of the robotic arm is really difficult to get right, and it's very, very expensive. This is another physical simulation of images of the moon's surface um, on a wall, and we have a camera on a, on a rail that can move forward and, uh, and across some of the lander. And that's a really good test system, but also it's really, really expensive. And actually, um, running the tests, and it still has the same calibration problems um, as the other ones. So this is images that that test system and DLR, DLR, which is a planetary institute in Germany. Um, these are artificial images that that um, created. Okay. So that's problem specification. Our solution was, well, we're computer scientists. Let's create virtual test environment to test these spacecraft. And let's make this a tool that um, developers of planetary scientists, uh, sorry, developers of planetary landers can use to test and develop their systems. And that's fundamentally um, what this project's been doing. I've been working on this for about 12 years, um, so you can have a significant part of my life. It is a very complex computing challenge. What we require to do is have camera images that simulate um, planetary surfaces so they can be feed into the test system. We need to generate them from the spacecraft position with realistic lighting. Um, they won't completely replace all the test systems, but they're an additional extra. So, getting a little bit back to um, teaching computer programming, one of the first things you always say is, who's going to use your software? So, who, who would be the users of my software? Well, they're the developers of planetary landers, the people who are trying to work out the initial test algorithms, so they can sit on their computer and they can develop their algorithms to process the images, um, to pick out craters, pick out feature points, try and work out where, where the spacecraft is with the relation just to the images alone. Um, and if that works well, they can then move on to higher, phases, um, higher levels of the test phase. They can do things like um, the open and closed loop testing. Um, we need our tool to integrate with other tools, so we need to provide interfaces to do that. Um, and our main customer is actually ESA, the European Space Agency, because um, they provided most of the funding. 
Um, what are the requirements? Well, I just chucked out a few very high level requirements because again, after our students have considered who's going to use the software developing, I would always ask them to specify what their, the requirements of their software to be. And once you start going into industry, of course, requirements then kind of become the contract that you have to meet your requirements for them to pay you the money. Um, so we need to generate images that are representative of the planetary surface. They don't have to be exactly what's there, as long as it's the same sort of thing that the uh, cameras would pick up so we can test and develop our software. Um, it's got to be representative of it. Um, we need to generate images in real time for closed loop testing. So we need to produce these images really, really fast. A descent to, to Mars or the Moon will be very quick. It'll be a few minutes. We have to generate images in real time really quickly, really accurately. Um, and we need to also simulate camera distortion effects because if we make perfectly what's there, that's not necessarily exactly going to be what would happen on the real spacecraft. A camera distorts things, so we need to have a camera model as well in the system. Um, what data can I use to do this? Well, again, I would always look at what other people are doing and what data exists. We can base our simulation on what information we have, and then we can add to it. So, for instance, when there's a whole wealth of planetary surface images we can use. There's things called digital elevation models. So that's basically um, a data source that says what are the height values of terrain um, at certain resolutions. So we can use that to create models from. Um, we know roughly, we, the scientists have given us information on things like crater distribution. So that's the proportion of small to big craters, what their form are like, um, what's the boulder distribution around the landing site. So we can get as much scientific data as possible. Um, there's surface reflectance models that how the different planetary surfaces reflect, so we can have that in our lighting model. So we gather as much data as we can. Um, the moon, that's the moon. We've got the near and far sides. Uh, that's what a sort of near, more um, images near a landing site would look like. We've got a whole bunch of craters. We've got high contrast between the light and dark. We've got boulders. Um, that's near the Apollo um, 17 landing site. It's quite a challenging bit of terrain to both simulate and to land on. Um, so that, that's a picture from uh, Apollo 17 um, as well. And I'll show you a little bit of what it's like. Here's a video, a very short video of Apollo 11 landing. So that's what actually the astronauts saw when they looked out the, the window of their, their lander. And you can see they're trying to land one of the safest areas of the moon here. And you can see there's still so many hazards. There's craters and um, all different uh, sizes. Um, there's boulders near the surface. Um, there's areas that are in shadow because of the craters. Um, so that's what we have to simulate to test our landers. So how do we do it? Well, we can start by getting the best terrain information that exists. So there is information on that, but it's not high enough resolution for a landing um, uh, simulation. So the one on the left is um, a Selini, that's a Japanese spacecraft, that image of the moon, um, image, uh, elevation model. So what we did is we took this elevation model and we turned it into a 3D graphics model and generated images from it. Um, and it's, you can, you, we can do this for landing simulation up to a certain resolution though. But the one on the right, the crater on the right there is about 21 kilometers across. So it's only good for the first bit of the descent, the information that's already there. Um, that's the south pole of the moon, the, the one on the right. Um, so what we do is we take these elevation models and we turn them into polygon models. So if you think of every height point in the elevation model, it's one um, vertex point in our model, and then we join them all together with triangle strips, and then we apply lighting models um, to render them. Okay, that looks terrible, doesn't it? Um, that's a rendered model from a digital elevation, sorry, a rendered image from a digital elevation model of the south pole of the moon using the best elevation model we could at the time. So that's really no use for a lander. Um, it's far too blurry because we don't have that many height points in, in, in the model. So what we need to do is turn that into a high resolution model where we can move our camera around and we can take images. Um, so we can feed them into our test system and we can test our landers. The moon and any body that doesn't have any air on it tends to be saturated in craters. So we also had to develop a crater model to add craters to that because this um, south pole of the moon is saturated in craters like you saw in the Apollo film, but we, we don't have the information of, um, in the elevation model, so we have to artificially add them to get realistic terrain. So we've looked at our problem, we've got our requirements, we've done, we have to do some software design. Um, we need to apply a realistic model, uh, sorry, realistic uh, reflection model. 
I'm not going to dwell on this diagram. I only chucked it up because all the conferences I go to in regarding to space, everyone chucks up block diagram after block diagram after block diagram. But basically, we split our model with our system into two. One generates the models, one creates the images. Okay. So, how did we implement it? Well, we've got this tool called the Planet and Asteroid Natural Scene Generation Utility, which is a horrible acronym, and it's called Pangu. And I wasn't responsible for the name. I've had the Pingu jokes at me far, far too many much over the years. Um, it's basically a tool that generates models of planets um, and asteroids and can generate images from these models. Okay? We developed it in C++, which is the best thing to do at the time because it was the best language that combined object-oriented um, ideas for large software development and also uh, low-level programming for very high speed because we, we really had to fight to get the, the computers of 10, 10 years ago to actually do what we wanted fast enough. Um, and we also need to have some sort of client-server architecture to fit in with the other tools in our test system. Um, so we start with the best evaluation models available. We add detail to them in terms of other craters, other boulders, and other terrain information. Okay? So we add the small-scale stuff in. Um, and then we need to generate images from our models. So our models are essentially polygon models, long strips of triangles um, that represent the terrain, and then we apply lighting and reflections models to that. Um, we can use graphics cards to do this at really high speeds because graphics cards these days let you write code that run directly on them um, to do some of the lighting effects, which you couldn't have done otherwise at high speeds. Okay, so I'll show you our, my first attempt that I was very proud of at the time, slightly embarrassed now. Um, we've got a, we, we get our terrain models, and this is showing you me defining crater positions to a certain distribution, and then we add it to the model. And that was that. Pretty good? I thought it was good at the time I was first doing it, but it's not really very good, is it? Um, and like all computer software of complex projects, you, you don't get it right first time. Um, and we don't even really try and get it perfect first time because it's just too difficult to do. So I, often, I always encourage my students to iterate, to try and get the minimum specification working, and then iterate and improve and iterate. So we did that. We iterated. We made our creative models a bit, bit more realistic with fresh ones and degraded ones. Um, we artificially increased the resolution of the terrain. So I've got here on the bottom of the left, low resolution, and I've artificially increased it on the top right. And we iterate again and again and again. And then we start to get looking a bit more realistic. So that's a synthetic um, image, artificial image um, of the moon that we can use for testing um, landers. And uh, it's not just the image that we can use testing. We've got the whole model. So we can generate images from any spacecraft position and any lighting angle. And that, that's the key thing for, for this, 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 this program. Um, and that, that's entirely artificial. There's no real data in that at all. Um, a lot of work went into that. Um, but we still use standard computer software development um, procedures and ideas um, mixed in with a bit of research because there was some stuff that wasn't, hadn't been done before and that's good for us because we can then get funding and write papers about it. So a mixture of computer science and, and research. We then add more features. We add rocks. Um, we add boulder models to simulate those rocks. These are all artificial. Um, and then we add realistic lighting models. So this is now much more accurate. Um, this is a, it's got a real lunar reflectance model. We've got a really interesting opposition effect where the, the light gets reflected back preferentially to, to, towards the, the source. Um, we've, got, we've got boulders and we can now create large models. So what we've essentially done is mix real data and artificial data to create simulations that we can test our spacecraft. Um, so I thought I'd show a, a, a video of one of our current um, simulations. So this is a simulated landing um, on the south pole of the moon. The sun angle is very low. Um, it's always about between about uh, I don't know, a half and two degrees um, elevation. So everything is in um, contrast. We've got bright and dark areas. This is spacecraft doing a diversion maneuver. The model was created by the best elevation data we could, which is about 250 meters between terrain height points, and we filled all the rest that down into the landing site. We've also got the challenge of making it the model very big, so you can have a realistic image when you're far away from the surface and zoom in and zoom in and zoom in and zoom in. So the initial images have to be maybe one kilometer per pixel on the image, and then down to the landing site, you know, 25 centimeters, 50 centimeters per, per image. So we have to organize your data in such a way that we can have enormous amounts of data and have it rendering at high speeds. 
the high speed rendering, the, the, the testers want us to do about 10 hertz. They want about 10 frames a second. So we're not doing computer games. The aim is not, not, not to have it looking as the same as a computer game. The aim is it to provide the images into our closed loop test system um, that would then allow our um, spacecraft to uh, analyze the images and then fly to the landing site. So now we're starting to head towards the landing site. You can see how challenging and horrible place this is to land. Most of it's in dark shadow. And this is where the European Space Agency, Space Agency want to land because they think they might be water ice inside those dark craters that the sunlight never um, reaches. And they also, there's some nice points on the peaks that are nearly always in sunlight. So our spacecraft can land, stick out its solar panels, get some power, send its little rover off into the craters to try and check if there's water ice. Um, so this, this is still a study phase, but it's something the European Space Agency want to do. They want to land on the South Pole. We're now doing a bit of divert. And we can now see, we can see the shadows of the boulders, not the boulders. And we're starting to run out of resolution now in the model. Um, and, th and that's our landing. So we've run out of resolution in the mo model now. <coughs> Bang. <laughs> um, and this is another simulation of asteroid Itakawa. Um, what we've got here is we've actually mixed the simulation with the real spacecraft. It's called the ephemeris. So that's the spacecraft actual spacecraft <coughs> position in relation to the asteroid body. Um, so our tool, we can input real spacecraft dynamic information and then use that to work out where the camera is to take the images. So this is exactly what the spacecraft um, that went to the asteroid Itakawa saw when it was um, orbiting it and going around it. It's, it's the exact trajectory. Um, and uh, we can use this sort of thing to test landing on other asteroids that we haven't seen before. It's a small rubble pile asteroid. It's quite small, um, only a few kilometers across. Um, and they actually landed on that asteroid, kind of a crash landed, and they tried to take some soil sample and take it back to the Earth. And they say they got something, but they're not sure how much they got. And I've not seen published anything from that, um, any, any, any information from it. But they did take in an amount amazing amount of um, sensor data, images. OK, we're starting to run out of time, so I'll shoot on. Um, so I thought I'd also show you our um, tool being used by an um, actual uh, image processing algorithm. So the one on the left shows a spacecraft model approaching the asteroid. The one on the right shows the image processing algorithm run on the asteroid. What it's doing is it's picking out points, feature points um, on the, the asteroid, and it's trying to track them from frame to frame. And you can use that information to work out where its position is relative to the asteroid, a bit like using sort of trig to try and pinpoint where you actually are. Um, the sunlight has gone out of sunlight now. You can see it now. It's also, you can see how challenging it is because the, the asteroid's rotating so fast. The longer the track, the more the feature point has been tracked from image to image. So this is sort of an example of using our, our tool to de develop an image processing algorithm to track features across the um, surface of the asteroid. Again, we're starting to run out, run out of um, resolution now. And uh, our little simulation just lands on it anyway. Um, we, the model isn't high enough resolution to have that, but actually it was the feature tracking thing we were tra trying to show. And we hit the surface, I think. Bang, yep. Um, and this is a simulation of Phobos, which is a potential future mission. The European Space Agency are wanting us to create models of Phobos, which is a moon of Mars, but this is, could be a captured asteroid. Um, so we're taking their low resolution data and making higher resolution models, which they can then render um, to create images from to simulate their spacecraft landing. Um, okay, so we've put an enormous amount of work into this, and um, how do we actually evaluate it? Well, we could just say it just works. <laughs> but nobody's really going to breathe that. So we have to show that what we've done bears in some resemblance to what the actual planetary surfaces would be, so we can use it to test it. Um, this is a mock-up of the one on the left, the Apollo image, and on the right, the artificial one. Okay? Um, it's not exactly the same. The one on the left's got some camera distortion from their, their old-fashioned camera. Um, but we have shown we can do our um, crater models quite accurately. This is our artificial image of the um, asteroid Itakawa, and that's a real one. Okay? So it's not perfect. Um, we think the little brighter bits might be because their model's slightly rougher than ours at the moment. Or it might be that we've not quite got our reflection model perfect. Um, oops, sorry. But we're, 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 we're quite close. Um, certainly enough to do um, reasonable testing on spacecraft landers. 
we, we also compare, we do um, quantitative analysis on our images. We compare our images quantitatively with images from uh, real ones and artificial ones. We do stuff like slope distributions, and we analyze the power spectrum and, and so on. So we do statistical analysis on our images. Um, and the, sort of the, the, the goal is then to make our images be used to run the image processing algorithms. So this is a static image showing um, feature tracking. So the idea is you've got a lander that's descending, and it picks out a feature point in the image. That's a point that the image processing algorithms can recognize from frame to frame. And you can see that the, all those points are spreading out, and that's because we're heading in for the center of that crater. Now, the one on the left, we took a low-resolution model and made it artificially high resolution, and the one on the right, we took the highest resolution elevation model that real. So the one on the right is real, one on the left is artificial. And we're showing that an image processing algorithm behaves quite similarly in both the real and the artificial. So we've convinced that the people at the European Space Agency that they can use our artificial um, models to test spacecraft landers. Um, since Karen ma mentioned Mars, I'll bri briefly, I was going to pause for that, I'll bri brief briefly mention Mars. Mars is different from the Moon in that it's got a more complex geology, it's got a bit of an atmosphere, um, but we can do the same approach to it. This is what's called the MOLA data set, which is an elevation model of the whole of Mars. So that's like a, a map of Mars. We've got the North Pole at the North, South Pole at the South. You can see that it's in two bits. The, the area at the North is quite low um, lying terrain, and the highlands are the, um, uh, the whole southern region. Um, but the highlands are much older terrain with much more cratering. I mean, it's possible that there was a sea in the, in the northern area. Um, so here's a very small simulation of Pangu on the left, Mola on the right. So we've enhanced it on the left, and it's the original one on the right. We're using it to test the spacecraft descending. And we've already run out of data on the right. We've just got a blurry simulation. And um, on the left, we've got um, artificial simulation. So we can um, si simulate a spacecraft landing um, on, 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 on the planet. Um, so basically, a sort of a summary is landing a spacecraft on a planet is a really difficult thing to do. Testing is essential, and um, for the surfaces vary enormously. The challenges are quite, are quite, are, are quite huge to both develop and test um, and prove this technology. But we've, we've spent a, the last 10, 12 years work, working on this in the University of Zundee, and um, we've, we haven't reached our goal, but we're heading there. And we've used a mixture of research and standard computer science development. We, we did all the standard, for each of our projects, we do all the standard phases of software development. So I like to sort of try and sort of show our first years when we teach Java programming to in the, in the very first few, few months of their, their computing science career at the University of Dundee that the stuff you're learning now can be taken and extended to larger um, and more complex projects. Okay. That's all for me. Um, any questions? Thank you. Um, we're running slightly behind. Sorry. Scheduled. No, it's not your fault. We started late, so it's not your fault in the slightest. Are you able to hang around for coffee? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep, yep. So if anyone has any questions, can I ask you to take them to the coffee break, and then we can move on to our, our next, next session. We've got our first session, and then it's coffee. Can we just thank Ian very much first? Thank you. Ian.